everyone. My name is Sandeep Nathan. I'm at the University of Chicago, and I'm here today with a number of my friends and colleagues to discuss the uh, recently published update to the Sky Shock Classification Consensus Statement. Uh, I had the great privilege of co-authoring the editorial for this document with Dr. Bill O'Neill, uh, and it's really a terrific uh, document. So I'm, I'm thrilled to uh, moderate this conversation uh, with my friends and colleagues, Dr. Harry Nadu, Dr. Tim Henry, Dr. Holger Thiele, and uh, Dr. Naveen Kapoor. Hari, why don't you, uh, uh, as the lead author on this and uh, the organizer, uh, why don't you uh, kick us off with uh, with some slides going through uh, some of the uh, the modifications to the document? Great, thank you, Sandeep. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and present this on behalf of uh, the expert writing group and SCAI, uh, five of whom are on this uh, call right now. So you can see those eight, the 16 people that were involved in this, and we're very proud of the representation across the board from critical care to emergency medicine to heart failure, and of course, international cardiology, as this is a Sky-led document. Um, I was chair, and Dr. Tim Henry was vice chair of the document. We're also very proud of the collaborating endorsing organizations. So seen here are the seven organizations that uh, fully endorsed the document that was uh, just published. As you can see, the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, uh, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, the American College of Emergency Physicians, the ESC, Inter uh, International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation, the Society of Critical Care Medicine. And of course, the goal here is that shock is seen in all these different venues. It's very important that the common lexicon is, is seen in all these venues from pre-hospital care all the way through to the critical care unit and the, and the cath lab. So we're very proud of that. From a methodological standpoint, this is a Sky-sponsored consensus update to the 2019 Sky Shock classification. We performed a PubMed review to collect studies examining clinical outcomes as a function of sky shock stage in any population. Recommendations were iteratively discussed by the full writing group in a series of virtual consensus meetings with majority agreement on the text and qualifying remarks. It was peer reviewed in September 2021 and endorsed by all collaborating organizations in December 2021 leading up to publication uh, this month. The first thing we did is go through all the validation studies, and these are the key ones in cardiogenic shock, CICU, and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And the first thing you'll see here, and that was striking to us, was that, uh, as we guessed, shock is not the same in all different uh, patient populations. If you see on the left here, even in the patients who are billed as cardiogenic shock, you have a variety of stages from A all the way through D. Uh, even in the sickest population, which was the NCSI and the Hansen study, you see more. C, D, and E, but you can see that shock is different depending on the population that's studied and it's not all the same. And that was proof of concept and why we went forward with the definition. If you go to a more mixed population of CICU and out of hospital cardiac arrest, you see a higher proportion of stage A, uh, relatively um, uh, patients at risk of shock, but not with any uh, hyperperfusion. And then you see patients, uh, a larger proportion of patients in this area with stage B, where they continue to have uh, uh, stable perfusion, and then a smaller percentage or less than half of patients in C, D, and E. So you can see that there is quite a variety and variability uh, even within different uh, subsets. The second thing, th thing we saw in the validation studies is regardless of cardiogenic shock, CICU or out of hospital cardiac arrest, sky shock stage does track with mortality quite uh, uh, linearly as you see here from A through E. In all the populations, E has the highest mortality, A has the lowest mortality, um, but one thing that step, uh, really uh, is very easily visualized here is that the mortality is quite variable depending on the population. So even though shock severity is very important and tracks with mortality, there are other modifiers. And so that was very key in terms of updating the document as you'll see. Uh, also data not shown here is that we looked at the validation studies in terms of um, ad admission shock stage uh, at 24 hours um, some of the studies looked at in-hospital um, mortality and then 30-day mortality and one-year mortality. And all of these different time points, the shock stage continued to be a robust um, signifier of mortality risk. So it was not only important in terms of admission, but over time, temporarily, that this relate to overall mortality risk and survival. So the validation studies showed that, number one, the classification was rapidly and broadly adopted over two years as a novel lexicon standard for cardiogenic shock. And I think we've all seen that. Number two, the classification was easy to utilize and feasible in all clinical settings, including both prospectively and retrospectively in database extraction. The classification successfully stratified mortality risk both short and longer term in hospital 30 and one year, as I just described. The stratification was consistent regardless of type of patient or presentation from CS, CICU, and out of hospital cardiac arrest to ACS, heart failure, and those with and without cardiac arrest presentations, uh, underscoring its strength and simplicity. 
However, as I already described, there were areas for further refinement that emerged, and that was the impetus for this update. So the first thing that became very clear is that how do you put the shock classification in context? So there is shock severity, as you see here, with the shock stage and some other variables, such as hemodynamics, metabolic arrangements, and vasopressor toxicity. But there are other modifiers at risk. There's the phenotype and etiology, and there's other risk modifiers. So there are some that are non-modifiable, such as age and comorbidities, cardiac arrest with coma, presence reversibility of organ failure, uh, systemic inflammatory response, and frailty and risk of complication. And then there's other phenotype and etiologies, such as acute and chronic versus acute cardiogenic shock, the clinical etiology of shock, AMI versus, uh, uh, for example, um, compared to decompensated heart failure. What is the phenotype in terms of RV versus LV versus BIV dysfunction, whether the lungs are involved, the congestion profile and biochemical phenotype. So when you add all these things together, you can't just look at shock stage, but you have to add these other areas and you'll see that the risk goes up or down depending on other modifiers. So what we did with the pyramid is we changed it slightly. So the, the categories remain the same. However, you can see now there are gradations of risk so that even within A, there are more sick patients based on the uh, three axis model and same with B, C, D, and E, such that you may have a very sick C patient that is, has a higher mortality than a less sick B patient. So that was one thing that came out from the data and we want to really stipulate in the update. The second thing we did here was we looked at the risk modifier from a cardiac arrest standpoint. And it was very clear from the data that in the first iteration, we described any cardiac arrest, even brief, uh, even if there's no neurologic uh, recovery immediately, such as a single defibrillation. However, that does not portend risk. And so the modifier uh, was uh, changed to include only cardiac arrest with concern for anoxic brain injury. And that's very important. The next thing we did is we moved on to the tables. So in the next couple slides, you'll see that the tables have been modified. The descriptions are the same. So A, B, C, D, and E are the same. But what we did here is we got rid of some variables that were really not useful in data sets and not useful in the clinical arena. And we made sure we concentrated on the key variables that were available. And we looked at uh, variables and we, so, um, we continued the physical exam, biochemical markers, and hemodynamics as the three axes that, uh, that uh, put you into the different categories. We also subdivided the different characteristics into what is typically included in that stage versus what may be included. And by doing this, it made it very clear, um, uh, a little bit clearer to, to categorize the patients between A, B, C, B, and E. So you can see A are still patients at risk. They have normal hemodynamics, normal exam, and normal lactate. B, these patients can, uh, typically are congested, but they're warm and well perfused. Uh, the normal lactate is still there, so the perfusion is preserved, and they have uh, some evidence of hypotension, perhaps, and tachycardia as a compensatory mechanism to maintain perfusion. If you look at C or the classic shock, now you have hyperperfusion. They may be cold and clammy. The lactate is now greater than two. And typically, when hemodynamics are performed, you typically see a, a reduced cardiac index and a high wedge pressure indicating congestion and poor perfusion. D then continues to have a, a persistently elevated lactate um, and continues to be hyperperfusion despite an intervention. And E, of course, remains the same. The one caveat being that we changed the lactate cutoff to eight from 10 previously, uh, more in tune with some of the literature that has come out in the ensuing two years. These patients are typically acidemic, uh, profoundly hypotensive and requiring multiple interventions. Another figure that we came up with that I think is going to be very important in terms of understanding the context of the shock classification is how do these patients evolve? How do they deteriorate and how do they recover? So you can see here, a patient starts with an acute cardiovascular event, which may be acute on chronic or an acute sudden event. This results in an escalation and deterioration from stage A to stage B. When compensatory mechanisms fail, they go to stage C. The intervention uh, is performed. If that works, they stay there. But if it doesn't work, they go to D and then they continue to go to E. So these are deterioration pathways. And on the flip side, you can improve a patient from E, D, C, B, and A. And from A, they can recover and become a cardiovascular, chronic cardiovascular condition, and hopefully no more further events. But one thing was uh, confusing in the first iteration was what happens when you have support and what stage do a does a patient end up with with that support? So for example, in the deterioration pathways, an acute catastrophic event in any of the stages uh, up here can land you right to E because these patients are refractory and are undergoing CPR and multiple interventions are being thrown at the patient. Uh, but all others have to stop in C before they get there because C is where you make that first intervention and the first determination about whether you've been able to stabilize the patient or whether perfusion continues to be compromised. 
On the flip side, you can improve a patient from E, D, and C, and if the perfusion remains, uh, gets normal with an intervention, these patients stay at C. So normalization of perfusion metrics while on support, either MCS or pharmacologic, improves you to stage C. So you stay at stage C. So for example, you put a uh, device in and the perfusion and the lactate comes down less than two, but the device is still in. This patient continues to be a C. Now, only when we remove that device, remove that pharmacologic support, if the perfusion stays normal, then they move on to B and then to A and then back to a stable situation. So to summarize, sky shock stage is an indication of shock severity and comprises only one component, but an important component of mortality risk prediction at all time points in carjoining shock patients, along with etiology, phenotype, and risk modifiers. Validation studies have underscored the correlation of sky shock stage with mortality across all subgroups and ease of use of the sky definition. Progression and improvement across the sky shock stage continuum is a dynamic process incorporating new information as available going up and down the scale, um, as you can see. A hub and spoke model we again talk about in the document to transfer high risk patients, including those with deteriorating uh, stage, um, uh, so that hopefully that'll be a future direction that this uh, triggers. Cardiac arrest is now defined as accompanied by coma, inability to respond to verbal stimuli with concern for significant anoxic brain injury. The sky shock pyramid and new figure now reflect gradations of severity within each stage and pathways by which patients progress or recover, highlighting stage C as a pivotal inflection point uh, indicating when a device or pharmacologic therapy is either working or not working. The table is updated to include criteria typically versus may be present. And finally, lactate has been highlighted with modified cut, cut points compared to the first document to confirm or refute hyperperfusion, understanding that there are non-carogenic causes of an elevated lactate, such as mesenteric ischemia or compartment syndrome. So finally, I, I do wanna thank Sky staff, especially Emily uh, Center, uh, Rob Bartel from the publications, Sky Publications Committee, Executive Committee and the Board of Trustees, collaborating endorsing organizations. Again, uh, it was quite a logistical um, uh, aspect to put all these people together, including the peer reviewers, CRF and TCT for the opportunity to present as a, as a featured lecture at TCT, and finally, J. Sky and Jack for publication and dissemination this month. Thank you. Thanks for that, Harry, uh, and congratulations to you, the authors, and, uh, and the committee for uh, putting together this fantastic document. Um, I, I found uh, the, the, the statement to be very forward-looking, very progressive, and uh, assimilating a lot of uh, data uh, that emerged over a very short period of time, really just two years worth of uh, data, and over 25,000 patients uh, were included in this, uh, in this document. Uh, but I wonder, uh, Tim, could you maybe give us some historical perspective uh, that sort of uh, anchors this document and uh, maybe identifies uh, some future directions moving forward? Yeah, I'd be delighted to, Sandeep. So first of all, great job, Hari. And um, I, so I would uh, like to give a few sort of uh, um, overview comments just from a perspective as number one, the vice chair of the uh, writing group. And then number two is the current president of Sky. I think there, this is a really uh, a landmark uh, publication um, for a number of reasons. So, so first I would like, this is, was a, an incredible experience. I think this is an outstanding writing group and uh, it really represents who's who in cardi uh, cardiogenic shock really around the world. And the fact that um, the document was actually endorsed by seven or eight societies, I think really illustrates the importance of it. And also I think that's an important collaboration of all the different societies. So, so if we're gonna actually make progress in treatment of cardiogenic shock, I think this is really an important step forward. Another really key, um, it, I'm really, um, and now I take on my president of Sky Hat, um, this is, will be in the inaugural issue of uh, JSKY, which will now be the official document, uh, official uh, journal for um, Sky. And we're very excited about this. So Alexander Lansky is the new editor. Uh, it's an incredible editorial board, including yourself. And um, so we're excited about that. And I think the second part of that really it um, is, uh, represents um, what we'll soon be announcing as a, uh, a publication and collaboration between the American College of Cardiology and SKY. I think this is a really important issue that um, 
never in history really has the relationship between uh, ACC and Sky been so strong in terms of coordinating the efforts for cardiology, but also interventional cardiology. So I think the the co-publication in both uh, Jack and J. Sky, I think, is um, a really important aspect of this. The third point I'd like to make is from a historical perspective. It's really from my standpoint, five years ago, we realized that one of the challenges in cardiogenic shock, when you look at registries, and um, uh, is that if you came in and you had a blood pressure of 90 and a wedge pressure of 25, that was called cardiogenic shock. And if you came in and you were in ongoing arrest and your um, uh, blood pressure was 60 and, and you were having ongoing CPR, that was called cardiogenic shock. And, you know, that I think was a challenge uh, in terms of evaluating clinical trials and comparing clinical trials and clearing, comparing registries. So the original vision to develop the classification, I think, um, has really been validated because um, uh, we uh, recognize the importance of putting granularity in cardiogenic shock and having uh, uh, more definition so that you could compare from trial to trial, from registry to registry. And I think this document is really uh, phenomenal in the sense that there's now been 14 manuscripts that have actually looked at and validated the importance of the uh, sky shock classification to predict outcome. And I think so that from my standpoint, clearly, uh, this has been a major step forward in how we uh, classify cardiogenic shock and allows it when we go forward in clinical trials to really put patients so that we're comparing the same patient population. And so um, from, from that standpoint, historically, I think it really validates the original document and I'm excited about it. I think people will look forward to it. But, and really what it also does is it really pushes forward. So uh, we spent considerable amount of time looking at uh, what did the validation studies show us? What are the key, key outcomes from registries around the world that have actually allow us to put more granularity in the classification to make it even stronger? So it, I think this is a critically important update. I think it provides a, a really important new information. I hard did a great job of, of, of uh, summarizing that. And so we're excited about this for a number of reasons. Um, the importance for patients with cardiogenic shock, but also uh, the fact that this is in, will be in the inaugural uh, issue of uh, JSKY. I think for me, it's really a landmark uh, time for both Sky and JSKY. Thank you. Super. Uh, well, thank you for that. Um, you know, I think, Tim, you highlighted a lot of uh, important points, very notably uh, the, the amount of collaboration and teamwork that it took to actually bring this to bear. Uh, I can only imagine uh, um, how difficult that was, but it's a, it's a fantastic document. I think, you know, what's interesting about the validation studies is that it really sort of spans the gamut of types of uh, patients, where they're actually being assessed, how they're being assessed, and there's remarkable similarity between them. Um, I wonder, Holger, could you give us uh, an international perspective on this? How is this uh, viewed in Europe? How is this being adopted? You've been at the vanguard of uh, shock studies for, for quite a long time and continue to, to lead in that area. What's, what's, your, uh, what's your view of this? Yeah, thank you, Sandy. First of all, it was a privilege for me, for sure, to be part of this writing group. And as you have seen, this has also been endorsed by the European Society of Cardiology and the Acute Cardiovascular Care Association. I think this is very important. So, so this is really a global uh, <clears throat> sky shock definition and an update and a refinement on this. So this is not only in the United States, um, not only in America and also um, in Europe and um, also in Asia. So this is, a, from, from my perspective, this is extremely important. And as already mentioned, I personally believe that this um, yeah, sky shock stages is extremely important to do randomized trials so that we have really the same patients in 
Um, as you may have seen, there's also already one publication in the New England Journal of Medicine on the comparison of mirror versus dobutamine, which used the sky shock um, definition. Um, you can find it in the table in the baseline character characteristics of the patient. So this also clearly shows the very early and very fast adoption of the sky shock stages. And um, <clears throat> therefore, I believe this will set um, the stage for future randomized trials so that we all always um, compare the um, same patients. What we already do in our ECL shock trial, which hopefully will be finalized by this year, so which is comparing VA ECMO versus standard of care in patient with cardiogenic shock. We already um, also according to our inclusion criteria, we only included um, stage D or E patients. So we do not include stage C patients. So we already also adopted the new refinement of the sky shock definition. I think this is extremely important and this is really a huge step forward. Wonderful, thank you for that. Um, Naveen, uh, you lead the cardiogenic shock working group uh, and uh, there's, I think, a uh, very interesting and provocative uh, paper on shock phenotyping uh, that was just published. How do you see the incorporation of uh, biochemical markers and uh, some of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the other uh, markers that need to be sort of trended uh, in a temporal fashion? How do, how do you see that being incorporated into the shock definition? Uh, and maybe you can uh, also talk a little bit about reassessment of shock stages uh, along the patient's course. Yeah, thanks indeed. And uh, thanks, everybody. I mean, again, just as Holder said, I was also very honored to be part of this group from the beginning and then now to see the updated document. It's really exciting to see this all come to fruition. Um, you know, it's a really fascinating document because what it does for the first time is it creates a system of classification that now enables phenotyping, which we really hadn't had in the past. And what that means is that we can now start to describe shock with much more granularity. At a very high level, it finally distinguishes MI shock from heart failure shock, which is a huge um, area of controversy. This has not been very clear. Prior to Sky Stages, there was only the Intermax classification, uh, and then, of course, separating that from Killip classification. So I think this really brings us into the 21st century and beyond and where we're headed. Um, and also, by having this system of classification, it now enables much more innovative approaches. So we developed some machine learning techniques. I think there's going to be a lot more work done with machine learning and AI and other techniques to really help physicians identify the type of shock they're dealing with. As was discussed, it'll also decrease heterogeneity in terms of trial enrollment. We're also beginning to see that. And it also highlights that even Sky Stage A is relevant. The door to load trial with anterior MI patients, that's a Sky Stage A trial. And this will also now lead into the next trials, which will be Recover 4 and beyond, and even the Alt Shock trial. One other thing that I think was really important to highlight was the involvement of heart failure societies. Uh, this is a document that originated within SCAI. And however, within SCAI, there's been for over a decade, a strong movement towards interventions for heart failure patients. And this sky stage document really brings that together right on the forefront for cardiogenic shock. And so it's exciting to have ICHLT involved and we look forward to other heart failure societies getting involved in the future. And finally, I'll say that in terms of the biochemical and the phenotyping aspects, I think we're going to learn an immense amount. Finally, folks have a document where they can look at something as simple as lactate, ALT levels, pH, and now they can start to come up with prediction models, not only to predict mortality, but also now to predict uh, recovery. And I think that's one of the most exciting aspects is the dynamic nature of sky stages. So I'm looking forward to the next 20 reports coming out in the next two years based on the updated document and uh, looking forward to working with this group uh, to get that done. Thanks for that, Naveen. I think we'll uh, open it up to any uh, final thoughts or comments. Uh, Tim or, uh, or Hari, do you, do you have any uh, thoughts as to where you go next with this uh, with this document? I think that you know it's gonna take everyone uh, a little bit of time to digest it because there are so many new aspects of this. One thing that sort of you know was ricocheting around in my head is what do you do with the cardiac arrest patient that uh, is showing early signs of neurologic recovery, but then end organ 
perfusion has been compromised. And we know that this is an independent predictor of adverse outcomes uh, in this cohort of patients. Um, and that's not specifically addressed. So I think that there are some, uh, some gaps and some things uh, that we're going to have to learn along the way. Uh, do you have some perspectives on uh, where, where we go with this uh, in the future, how we apply this? So I'll, maybe I'll go first and really address the cardiac arrest because I do think this is a critically important part of this. So, so um, for everybody on, uh, on the call listening to this is, you know, the interaction between cardiac arrest and cardiogenic shock is critically important. And we've known that. And I think, uh, but what we saw, and I think what we uh, did with this document is really clarify cardiac, that it's cardiac arrest with unknown neurologic recovery. So if someone has a, uh, is, gets shocked and then wakes up and has a, a normal neurologic status, that's, that may not be a, um, a significant modifier. But we certainly know that the patient with a both either in hospital or out of hospital cardiac arrest with unknown neurologic um, outcome, you know, so in a coma, uh, really changes the um, uh, overall outcome. And that's true at every stage. So it's true in A, B, C, D, and E. And so I think that's a key thing. And that's a really important issue because, um, for example, let's say we're designing a clinical trial where you're going to look at mechanical circulatory support. But yet, um, half of your patients had a cardiac arrest. And when you have a out of hospital cardiac arrest or in hospital cardiac arrest, one of the key things is you may die of brain death, may have nothing to do with uh, what the mechanical circulatory support can help. So I think that modifier and um, what we did in the current document is really provide more granularity that will be really helpful. So I think this interaction of cardiogenic and shock and cardiac arrest is a, a critically important issue. Yeah, I'm going to take a, another stab at uh, where we go from here, which is, you know, it is true that this was widely adopted, but it really was widely adopted within interventional cardiology and cardiology, I think, globally. Where it hasn't been adopted and where it may be the most potent is in the pre-hospital you know, as you can see, we focused on physical exam findings, biochemical findings, and hemodynamics. Hemodynamics are really only present in the cath lab or the CCU or ICU setting. But the physical exam and the biochemical markers are sequentially seen in the, in the ER and the pre-hospital uh, stay. Um, and so I think it's very important to get those societies really involved in this and get more data and validation studies in the pre-hospital arena, in the emergency room, so that we can then move over time to where EMS takes these patients. Should they be taking patients only to these, uh, these hubs or the spokes? Which stages should go to the spokes? Which stages should go right to the hub? How do you determine that? How do we teach this to the EMTs? How do we teach this to the emergency room, which has biochemical markers, they'll have the lactate, they'll have the ABG. Um, so I think that's a, a big uh, a part of where this definition needs to impact in my opinion. Super. Holger or Naveen, any final thoughts before we uh, before we wrap up this session? So if you ask me, so first of all, I don't know, final wrap up is clearly that we should just um, now start to implement um, these um, th this definition. I probably this is the most important issue we have to do in registries, in randomized trials and in clinical practice. And this will hopefully help the patient. And I'm fully convinced that this will help the patient and also will help us regarding signs, um, also uh, <clears throat> defining new treatment options for patients with cardiogenic shock. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll hearken everything that everyone said so far. Um, there's no question that this is going to highlight, uh, you know, cardiogenic shock. I think it provides, again, that much needed data. Uh, and information that will allow for future studies. You know, this cardiogenic shock right now remains probably the number one cause of death that really has been challenging all clinicians around the globe. Uh, it is very much like some of the most complex multi, uh, multifactorial syndromes that are out there, but everything is moving at Mach 10. And so as a result, you have to have these types of tools at your disposal to really make those decisions very quickly. Mechanical support, I think, is a great example of innovation that's been outpacing our knowledge. And finally, Sky Stages now allows us to get finally some uh, some reins around 
these horses that have been coming out of the barn to try to understand where they go, how to direct them. So I'm really excited for the future. And I think Sky Stages clearly is going to help drive that going forward. That's a, a, a terrific uh, summary statement. I think uh, we'll uh, conclude there. Thank you uh, all for joining me um, and uh, discussing this uh, critically important document. And uh, big thanks to the uh, to the writing committee for uh, putting this together.